two-stage approach. We're talking about when we deal with direct application, typically direct vertical application of the Bill of Rights, how do we go about to do that? In the first instance, we have to say, okay, we have a statute, typically, that someone wants to challenge for its invalidity. Some aspect that infringes upon a right. So then we have to determine the meaning and the scope of the right. We have to look at the provision that is challenged, compare that to the rights, to see whether they have any impact on the rights. And then in the second instance, we deal with the limitations analysis, which we think is essentially a way out. Now, in addition to that, I want to very briefly touch on internal limitations of rights. So those of you who make statistical analysis of exam papers, you would have seen sometimes there's a throwaway 10 mark question. What is the distinction between a special limitation, a derogation, and a demarcation? And that's usually a 19 or 10 mark question, which um, in, uh, has as a guess 10% of all the students in all the years have ever answered that question successfully, and it's 10 marks on a platter. So we're going to look at those internal limitations very briefly, but um, that's only in cases of desperation that I resort to such late question. But okay, so this you've seen before. You first have to determine the particular scope of the relevant protected right. So if I say to you that there's a group of people who are wanting to do research on stem cells, human stem cells, they are told legislation will stop you from doing that. We have to say, which are the rights that are applicable and what is the content of the scope of the rights? Then we have to turn to the legislation that we want to contest or that we want to test for its constitutional validity. And we have to say, what does it mean? And if you have to draw a picture, you say, okay, this is what the right means. And this is what the statute does. It eats into the right. But then the question is, is this eating into the right? Can it be justified? And you will recall the second part of the test, which we've looked at yesterday, requires a weighing up, a proportionality analysis. We've done this yesterday, so I'm just going to quickly skip through that. A weighing up of the nature and the importance of the right, together with the extent of the limitation against the importance and the purpose of the limitation. So essentially what we're saying is, to what extent does this proposed limitation serve a purpose that we can say is a constitutionally worthwhile purpose, and to what extent does it limit the right, and is that justifiable if we take into consideration the nature and the importance of the right, together with the extent of the limitation. So what we're trying to determine in the limitations analysis, which is a proportionality analysis, we try to say, is this an infringement or is it a justifiable limitation? And that's the engagement that we're trying to, to perform when we engage in a limitation analysis. So what I want to do today is I want to look at what that second stage requires in detail. And the second stage is typically also referred to as the section 36 limitations analysis. So what we are doing now with a direct application two-stage approach is we're learning to bake a very basic cake. And then we're going to put all sorts of sprinkles on this cake or in the batter because we're going to bake a red velvet, we're going to do a chiffon cake, we're going to do a custard cake because each of the rights analyses, equality, freedom, security of the person, socio-economic rights, freedom of expression, each of those depart from the basis of the two-stage approach. But we need to get this generic recipe right. So what we have to do in the first instance is when we talk about this limitations analysis, we call it a proportionality analysis of weighing up. But what do we weigh up? How do we weigh it up? And this is what I want to talk about today. So in the first instance, in the top there is the text of the Constitution. And the bottom here is a uh, discussion. So don't bother about writing down the top. Section 36.1 says, the rights in the Bill of Rights may only be limited in terms of a law of general application. What do we get here? If I purport to limit a right, freedom of movement, freedom of scientific research, I cannot do that by giving an executive order. 
I cannot do that by administrative action. I have to do it in terms of a law of general application. And this harks back to the idea of a rule of law. Because if I infringe or limit someone's right, and I do that without a legal basis, I'm infringing the rule of law. So it's a fundamental important principle to recognize that rights cannot be limited arbitrarily for no apparent reason. If a right is to be limited, that right may only be limited in terms of the law of general application. Now, what then is a law of general application? What is not allowed to limit a law, uh, to limit a right that is set out in the Constitution? Do you remember Mr. August? Have you met him before? He so desperately wanted to vote in the election, but he was in prison. So he wanted to vote, and the IEC, the Independent Electoral Commission, had a policy. They said, we're not taking voting stations to the prison. There was nothing in the Electoral Act that said prisoners cannot vote. The Electoral Act says if you're 18 and you're of sound mind and you are not subject to any of those exclusionary criteria, you can vote. There's nothing that says in the Act of Parliament that a prisoner can't vote. So Mr. August went to court and he said, I have a right in terms of Section 19 to participate in elections. My citizenship rights are being infringed. So the court said, yes, indeed they are. But what infringes your right? Is it a law of general application? No, it's a policy decision that was made by the IEC to say, we can't have voting stations at all the prisons. And that is not something that is rooted in law that gives authority. There are some, there are some countries where prisoners are not allowed to vote. So the question then is, it is a law of general application, but then we have to continue with the rest of the analysis to determine whether it meets the standard that, are, that is set out in the Constitution for limitation. So a law of general application then. Oh, come on. Is sufficiently clear, accessible, and precise. And all of this should remind you of our discussions of the rule of law. Because we need to know how, what it is that we have to do so that we comply with the law. And if the law is vague or imprecise, I don't know what it is that I have to do. So, the Constitutional Court has said, original legislation, what is original legislation? That is an act of Parliament. That is a law that legitimately may limit the rights of a person. Delegated legislation, what is delegated legislation? Regulations. So regulations made in terms of an act may justifiably limit the rights of a person. The common law, because that, those principles are known and practiced and they've been crystallized over the years through interpretation by the courts. So if there's a common law provision that says you may not trespass, that is a law of general application. Customary law may limit the rights of people in a justifiable fashion. So what we see here is that the court has a very wide take on what could justify as a law of general application. Now, the question then is, if we talk about executive rulemaking, and here the court has been divided, if the president passes a presidential act, for example, to pardon, offend, pardon an offender, is that a law of general application? Or is it an executive act that does not amount to uh, a law of general application? A policy or a practice? I think August's case tells us that a policy or a practice does not have the qualities of a law of general application. You cannot use a practice and say, but we've always done it like this. So it is justifiable to use this practice not to make a voting station available in prisons and therefore Suck it up, Mr. August, you are not allowed to vote. Administrative action. If administrative action is rooted in law and is exercised in accordance with the principles set out in the original or the delegated legislation, it may justifiably limit the rights of people. But it's important that we have to 
bear in mind, it has to be sourced ultimately in either original legislation, <coughs> delegated legislation, common law, customary law. So it has to be traced back one way or the other to be a form of law that we recognize as regulation in our society. Okay, so the very important question here, or aspect is that we have to note that it must be non-arbitrary. And you will recall that in Makpanyani's case and in all our discussions of the rule of law, we said the requirement is that there must be a rational basis. And if the law lacks a rational basis in how it purports to limit the right, then clearly we have, we have exceeded the bounds of what is required by a simple phrase, a law of general application. If rationality, in other words, is absent, if I want to protect the right of freedom of speech, but I say you're not allowed to travel somewhere, that doesn't necessarily <coughs> correlate. Because freedom of expression is one thing, but it can manifest in a variety of forms. But if I put a travel ban up, that doesn't necessarily speak to the purpose that I wish to achieve. So there must be a correlation, a rational link, between the exercise of power and the purpose for which the power was given. And then in this last instance, it must be general in its application. And this is very difficult. Because laws very particularly or often are enacted to give a benefit to a group of people, children, uh, people in domestic partnerships, taxpayers, whatever the case may be. But what one has to bear in mind is that, that laws must apply in person. It mustn't be for a specific person. Now here the court has had division as to whether the executive rulemaking of a president, or as it was seen as such by Krichler, whether that targeted specific people. You remember the case of Mr. Yuger? He, of the child of the age of 12, who was in prison. The president said, okay, in celebration of my inauguration, I will let mothers of children under the age of 12 out of prison as a mark of the celebration of my inauguration. Judge Kepler, in this particular instance, says, this is not a law of general application. It targets specific people. Does it? It's not general in its application. Whereas Judge Moncuro, for the, um, and, and the majority of the court agreed with that interpretation, that law should not be interpreted narrowly. Where executive rulemaking is authorized by the Constitution, and it allows for something like presidential targets, that should meet the requirement of the law of general application. And here, you can see that there's disagreement, but what we are ultimately aiming for is to determine, is this either original legislation, delegated legislation, customary law or common law that is general in its application, non-arbitrary and rational, and applies impersonally? And only in those circumstances have we met the first threshold to determine whether the limitation is justifiable or not. Now then if you look at the text of section 36, it carries on to say the following. That is, uh, once again at the top, the text of the Constitution. To the extent that the limitation is reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality, and freedom. So what we get here is we get a constitutional requirement that we may only limit rights for purposes that are acceptable in an open and democratic society. So if a society is not, the, the idea of an open and democratic society is not served by the particular enactment, that gives us a clue that perhaps this is an infringement, not a justifiable so the reasons for the limitation must be acceptable in an open and democratic society. And it must not only be, the purpose or the reason must not only be acceptable, but there must also be proportionality. So it can't infringe or obliterate the right. Now, an interesting aside here is that the, the interim constitution referred to Necessary. Now here, this text of the Constitution does not require that the limitation
facilitation of the right must be necessary. But what we get quite clearly is that you cannot say, I would like to protect the right to life. Therefore, I will take all the rights of freedom of movement, freedom of speech, all of those other things away. Because you have to look at how far does the limitation reach into the right? And is it proportional to the purpose that the limitation is meant to serve? So, what one has to do is you have to show that the limitation brought about by legislation, common law, original delegated legislation, customary law, that it serves a constitutionally acceptable purpose. So, if the purpose in the first instance is not one, say the purpose for passing a particular piece of legislation is to further the ends of a particular elite group <coughs> of politicians in society. Because the net effect of implementing the legislation will be that all the procured contracts or state procurement will go to a particular small group of people. Clearly that is not a purpose that is acceptable in an open and democratic society. So whatever you have to look at as a purpose for the limitation of a right, you have to say, is this a worthy purpose? Is it worthy in our society to protect the dignity of people? Is it worthy in our society to protect the interests of creditors? Is it worthy in our society to provide specific protection for vulnerable women and children? Is, what, what are the purposes that are regarded as constitutionally <coughs> acceptable in our society? And then in the second instance, there must be sufficient proportionality. And what do I mean by that? There must be a balance. There must be a balance between that which you try to achieve and the way in which you're trying to achieve it. You shouldn't crack a nut with a sledgehammer. That's basically what it requires. If it is possible for you to achieve your constitutionally acceptable purpose by taking a particular line, you shouldn't go all out and obliterate all the other rights and all the other interests because you are in pursuit of something particularly narrow. So don't crack the nut with a sledgehammer. Use a nutcracker. That's more appropriate. So there must be a balance between that which you want to achieve and the way in which you go about to achieve it. Now, how do we measure this proportionality? And section 36 gives us a lot of cues. And section 36, as a matter of fact, is based on a paragraph in Mafanyan. If you look at the text of the Constitution and you go back to this particular <coughs> paragraph in Makanyana, you will see that this is what is required. It involves, and this is why I'm calling it a balancing exercise, a weighing up of competing values and balancing interests. And you have to look at all of those factors, <coughs> because all of those factors were the ones that were set up in the Constitutional Court or by the Constitutional Court in Bafanyan. So you have, you have to look at each of those different factors and you have to say, what do they reveal about the purpose, effect, and importance of the limitation as against the nature and the effect of the infringement? And you see, it takes us back all the while. It takes us this, what Section 36.1 does, is it gives us perspective on the specific <coughs> aspects that we have to consider when we engage in this balancing exercise. Because it tells us we have to look at the nature, the extent, the purpose, and we have to weigh all of that up in coming to a conclusion as to whether we're dealing with an infringement, which is not justifiable, or a justifiable limitation, which we can live with. And that goes back to what I said right at the beginning of yesterday, not a single right is absolute in its function. My right to life in certain instances can be limited. And I want to take you back to Governor's case. Remember Mr. Governor <coughs> sued the police because his son was shot in the back. Section 49 of the Criminal Procedure Act says, the life of a criminal may be taken in pursuit if it meets the requirements. So can you see that's quite far-reaching? Because what happens, in fact, is that the legislature says, if you are really, really, really very naughty, and the only way in which the police can capture you, or 
will stop from committing an offence. It's okay if they kill you. And that's a justifiable limitation of your right. But can you see if we abuse that, the police can go around restaurant and centre and shoot people, kill them and say, oh, she wanted to steal a packet of chap chappies or whatever it is. And that was the end. We just need that we need to deal with it. And obviously, that lacks that proportionality. So, Section 36 has a number of factors. So what are the factors? The first one is the nature of the right. Now, what I'm telling you now comes from the analysis that the court identified in Makwanyane. So for the greater part, I'm going to use Makwanyane as my example. But the important thing that you have to bear in mind here is that to some extent we're working with something that could be contradictory. Because what our constitution does is it does not create a hierarchy of rights. But in Mahayana, we, say, we see the court saying, some rights are more important than others. And the reason why the court says this is the following. If you do not have the right to life, or if you are not alive, and you do not have dignity in being alive, your right to vote, your right to pursue your career, your right to freedom of expression, your socioeconomic rights, all of them mean nothing. They are dependent on the fact that you are alive and living with them. <coughs> so that's what it's meant, is meant, when the court says that some rights are more important than others. Because if you are not alive, none of your rights make any difference whatsoever. But if you are alive, then you have the ability, the capability, to exercise your rights. So the court says, if we are wanting to infringe or limit an important <coughs> right, we have to say, well, actually, there must be a really good reason to do so. So the task of the court then is to say, how important is this right in our constitution? How can we live? Can we live without the right to vote? Can, or is it quite an important right in our constitution? Can, how important is freedom of expression? Is it the most important thing? Or can we say, actually, in our society, dignity and equality, those are fundamentally important because historically they've been denied to people. Okay, so the court has to look at each and every instance, how important, what is the nature of this right and how important is it in our constitutional scheme and how do they do that? The court says an important right serves the ambition of the constitution to create an open and democratic <coughs> society based on human dignity so if we try to figure out, is this right one of those rights where we can say, actually, in order to limit this right, we have to have really good reason. We have to say, does it serve the purpose? What role does it play in the establishment of an open and democratic society based on human dignity, freedom, and equality? So in Mahmoud case, to illustrate the court's consideration of the nature of the right. DPs, not your duly performed certificates, but, you know, could be similar. Death penalty. The court says <laughs> <laughs> the death penalty infringes upon your right to life, your right to human dignity, and your right to be free from cruel, inhuman, degrading treatment. So the court identifies the relevant rights to be life, dignity, and freedom from cruel and human degrading treatment. And if you read through the text of Makanyani, you will see how all of those are clearly indicated. Life, I think, is beautiful. You are hanged by your neck until you die, you're dead. You don't have life. Human dignity. And this is a difficult right to actually try and capture, but we're going to look at human dignity. And then you will see that human dignity is about autonomy, it's about making your own decisions, it's about living a life in which you are respected by others in, way in which you respect yourself. And if that is undermined, it's not about subjectively how <coughs> it is, it's about not being an object. That's what it is about. And the right to be from cruel and human degrading punishment. If you read the judgment, and I think it's, I think it is Sachs's judgment, I'm not the stand corrected. He explains what happened, no, it's actually a Reagan's judgment. It, she explains what happens when someone is 
hang by their neck until they die. And it is a cruel, inhuman, and degrading punishment. And Judge Muhammad went as far as to say, it's not only cruel and de inhuman for the person who's being hanged, but also for the person doing the hanging. Okay, so the court says, in this scheme, life and dignity are very important. Because without that foundation, none of the other rights actually have any impact. So if we want to limit the right to life, and we want to limit the right to dignity, the court says, we must have damn good reasons to do so. So we can't just say, well, okay, dignity is important, and we, we just will allow whatever old purpose to be served by the limitation of someone's right to dignity, because, because. You have to find and provide either for the law, the legislation, the regulation, the common law or customary law, a really good reason, a purpose <coughs> that is constitutionally consonant in order to justify the limitation of the right. Subsection B says you have to look at the importance of the purpose of the limitation. <coughs> Why are we trying to do this? Why do we have the big thing? What is the purpose that that serves in our society? And the court says a purpose is justifiable if it is worthwhile in our constitutional setup, in our constitutional frame. So we have to say, what is the purpose of the limitation of the right? So we have three rights in question. Life, dignity, freedom, free, to be free from cruel, inhuman, degrading treatment. Now that we have those, we have to say, what purpose does the death penalty play? And the court identified three purposes that the death penalty may play. It serves to deter violent crime. It prevents the recurrence of violent crime. And it is a fitting retribution for violent crime. Those generally are seen as the purposes that the death penalty may serve. It deters violent crime. Now, here, if you, if you look at the judgment of the court, you will see that the court takes this, but it notes that this is not something that is necessarily proven in scientific studies. I mean, I personally have not engaged in any violent crime in the sense that I've thought of it. I've thought about touching people, but I've never said I want to kill someone. But okay, so if you think that you want to commit a, a heinous crime. Put yourself in the boots of a criminal for a moment. Do you think there are many criminals who go, well, I'm not going to do this because I might be killed? I think the majority of criminals go, I'm going to do this because I won't be caught. I don't think there's a lot of rationality that goes into the decision as to why am I not going to do this? Oh, I can't do this because I need to bear in mind, if I'm caught, I could be hanged. It, pres it, it presumes a hell of a lot of rationality in the plan of crime. Yes? Um, but don't you think it could stop a new criminal from Absolutely. entering the market? And the second one, <laughs> new, new criminals entering the market? <laughs>
not acceptable in an open and democratic society. And this is, I think, for the great part, why people think the death penalty is a fitting retribution. People think an eye for an eye. You killed me, the state should kill you. And the court says, purpose three, fitting retribution for violent crime, is not acceptable in an open society based on Ubuntu and reconciliation. Vengeance and retaliation is not worthy of constitutional protection. You can agree or disagree with the court, but that is what the court held. Talk to me. Oh, do you, where do you want to start? Humaneness. Um, I'm a person because you're a person. Um, Judge Bokora's judgment, if you want to go and see, that she, she gave a really good exposition of her understanding of Ubuntu and the impact of Ubuntu in our society. So if I'm a person who cares, and if I'm a person through other people, vengeance and retaliation should not be fitting as a victim. Okay, but let me move on. The court says, I know that citizens have certain opinions, and citizens' opinions are important, but citizens' opinions are not the reason that the court has to make its judgment. The court will take note of public opinion, but the court's not going to say, because the public says X, therefore the law is constitutional or unconstitutional. Because it is well known that the public is fairly fickle and it changes its mind like that. <clears throat> Today something is acceptable, tomorrow it's not acceptable. And the Constitution tries to provide some sort of level of certainty, some level of measure of stability in our society. So I'm not going to go through all the purposes that the court has found to be worthwhile, but you can look at page 167 of the Curry and Deval text. <clears throat> then we have to look at the nature and the extent of the limitation. How far does this limitation go? What is, what is the impact of that on the right? Does it do more harm than the purpose that it serves? So the court says we have to assess the level of harm, the degree of harm. And in the instance of the death penalty, it is irrevocable and final. It obliterates the right. There is no more right. What is the extent of the impact of the limitation on the right? So you have to look at what is the effect, what is the impact of the legislative enactment that allows for the death penalty. It, when it is carried out, leads to the end of the right. There is nothing left. Now remember the purposes. Prevention of crime, oh, yeah, deterrence of crime, Prevention of recurrence, because we're not looking at vengeance and retaliation. Because the court says those are not worthy in our society. Now we have to say, are there other ways, perhaps, in which we can serve those purposes? So the court says, what is the relationship, and that is paragraph B, between the limitation and its purpose? There must be a link. If there's no link, if there's no balance between the two, it points to this limitation to amount to an infringement rather than a justifiable limitation. So you have to look at the proportionality of the harm of the infringement and the purpose. So the death penalty serves to deter and prevent the recurrence of violent crime. Yes, by the same offender. But that's it. Because the same offender, if taken out once, can't do it again. But the court says that's not sufficient to draw a very clear link between the deterrence of violent crime and the death penalty. We hope that it will prevent people from entering the crime bar. But the reality is, it won't. Because human experience has told us there will always be someone to take the place. Okay, so the court says there may be some link, but it's not a sufficient link to say that there won't be an infringement or that there, that there is a link between deterrence and <coughs> the death penalty. Now then the last purpose or the last subsection, subsection, you have to find a balance between the purpose of the limitation and the cost of the limitation. And the court says are there other ways in which we can achieve the purpose? So what is it that we want to do with the death penalty? We want
have to deter violent crime and prevent the recurrence of violent crime. We want to keep society safe. How can we keep society safe? Is there a better way of doing it? The court says, yes. You can, if you take into consideration what the impact of the death penalty is, the end of life, and you see, is there another way in which we can serve that purpose to deter violent crime or to prevent violent crime, we can serve that through life imprisonment. I mean, all of this is premised on systems that work, that there's actually rehabilitation in prison, for example. <coughs> okay, so what I want you to be able to do is bear in mind that when we engage in this limitations analysis, we have to look at the factors in section 361 a to E and look at what each of them reveals, put them in the scales on the side where they should be and weigh it up. And say, in the instance of Bakwanyane's case, the court says the purpose <coughs> of the death penalty and the extent of the impact of the death penalty against the importance <coughs> of the right, the right is more important. The right is more important than the purpose and the extent of the limitation. So what you have to do in your bland cake recipes is you have to engage in each and every instance in this weighing up exercise where you say, okay, this is the extent, the effect, and this is the purpose. And where, does the, do, where do we strike the balance? And that is an important thing that we have to do when engaging in this limitation. As I said, obviously, um, one has to bear in mind that this is premised, the idea of life imprisonment is premised on um, that the systems are working and that the actual rehabilitation takes place. I think it's only in those instances where you have handmade tales of uh, uh, public executions that you can say that the death penalty really serves as a terrorist. But yeah, I leave that to get at. Constitution, which means that it may somehow be necessary to look elsewhere in the Constitution to determine whether the limitation of a right is justified. So other than the Constitution, other constitutional provisions may limit rights if are fundamental rights. And this was clearly illustrated in the Azarpu case, where Azarpu challenged <coughs> the constitutionality of the promotion of National Unity Act, and they said this act granting amnesty limits our right to freedom of ex uh, access to court because we would like to institute proceedings against people who infringed our rights under apartheid. And the court says, what limits your right is this enactment that is rooted in the Constitution. Because the post amble of the interim Constitution particularly refers to that legislation that furthered the goals of reconciliation I'm not sure whether I'll get to internal limitations. Can I, can I leave internal limitations to you? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's two minutes. We can either work for two minutes or you can leave and do it yourself. Two minutes. Wow. <laughs> I've, I've seen something I've never, never seen. Before. Okay. The majority of rights are textually unqualified. 
constitution are not textually qualified. Which means that when we make our cake, we interpret the right, we interpret the challenge provision, we engage in the section 36 analysis. Now the question is, where you have a textual qualification, what do you do with that? Where does it fit into this two-stage approach? Now, section 15, 16, and 17, and section 15 deals with freedom of religion, belief, and opinion. Section 16 deals with freedom of expression, but it excludes the advocacy of hatred. So the question is, where we have such a textual qualification, and we call those textual qualifications demarcation, where does it fit into the two-stage approach? It fits into the interpretation stage. <coughs> because the textual qualification says to us, this is what the right includes, and this is what it excludes. We're going to look at this fairly carefully when we look, and for those of you wanting to start on your um, assignment over this fantastic long holiday that we have, this is, this, is, this is a cue. Section 16.1 tells us this is what is protected. This is not protected. So section 16.2 says if you engage in hate speech or propaganda for war, don't think that you can claim the protection of the Constitution. <coughs> so if we have legislation impacting yeah, and say, everyone who advocates or propagates for war is guilty of a crime. And I want to go to court to challenge the constitutionality of that. The court's simply going to say to me, stage one, interpretation. What does it protect? What does it not protect? What is prohibited falls squarely outside the protection of section 16. You are guilty, therefore you propagate his hatred, therefore you have to go to prison or pay a fine or whatever. So a demarcation plays a role in the interpretation of the right. <coughs> okay. But in, in, a, in addition to demarcations, we have special limitations. And special limitations are those sections that tell us the legislature can regulate this right. Section 22, 23 are examples of special limitations. Special limitations say, you have the right to, to pursue your profession, section 22, but it can be regulated. Which means if I want to be a lawyer, I can't just say, I'm a lawyer, yeah, yeah, I am. It is regulated, and legitimately so. Okay, section 23, everyone has the right to fair labor practices. It is regulated. Okay, that's a special limitation. Demarcation is the comma but. Here. A special limitation requires us to look at the legislation. Because a special limitation is where we have the Labor Relations Act, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, the, uh, a variety of other sections indicate the instances where we have special limitations. And then lastly, just for the sake of... Uh, okay, so here are examples. I'll, I'll make these slides available so that you can see trade and profession, Legislation and collective bargaining. And then we have, and this is for the full set of the 10 mark question, derogations. And what are derogations? There are severe curtailments <coughs> under a state of emergency. Those are the only 